fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Now this is our last show before spring break. So I thought I'd, I'd you know, have a, a guest on that we, we've run across each other a few times. He's in sort of the same business in our past cross, let's say that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then the name is great, uh, especially for the American audience. They'll think it's I- I- exotic. Uh, so the, <laughs> na- the name of the, of the podcast is the Dark Poutine Podcast. And the uh, creator, owner, um, host, uh, cook, janitor is mike brown that's me <laughs> uh always a lot of work isn't there oh yeah oh my goodness there's there's always so much to talk about it's it's bizarre and even here in canada i would think that i would be running out of crimes i mean we are te- we tend to be quite polite but uh interestingly there's a lot of stuff that bad things that happen here so i'm not going to run out of stories i think for Probably around. I'm looking at 400 episodes now. <laughs> oh, well, and 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 if you do need some more, just just hit me up. And I'll go get something going. Oh yeah, we are going to talk to you. We're going to do. We do uh, mostly Canadian true crime. So uh, we cover cases that happen within the borders of Canada or uh, that a Canadian was involved in in some way outside of the Canadian uh, borders, but. Um, we do want to, we do every once in a while, we'll do what's called an away game, and it's sort of a play on hockey. So, hockey players go away, they have home and away. So, we have away games, and we've done away games like Chikatilo in Russia. Uh, recently, we did the North Hollywood shootout, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, but we do want to talk to you eventually about uh, Rodney Alcala because I know that you wrote a book and and I'm pretty fascinated with that case so perhaps one day you and I will have a conversation on my podcast about Rodney Alcala uh, <laughs> yeah I've, I've had an interesting time with him I bet yeah on and off um, quite a bit of time and uh, quite a few people involved in the family and the and uh, and that was one I couldn't go wrong. It seemed like every detective I needed to find that was covering the case I had had on the radio show or knew, oh, wow. or knew them. And I had, wow. their, I had their cell phone number. That's great. <laughs> what are you talking that... about? I, I just kind of thought, well, this is meant to be, I guess. It makes it easy to write a true crime book when you have this, the uh, the detective on speed dial. Yeah, yeah, and and then uh, we and then we all got together. Um, Oxygen Network in the states just did a show on it, and it was based on the book. And uh, mm-hmm. and uh, I was on for the hour. Um, yep. And and yeah, I look pretty old. <laughs> nah, you look great. I saw it. it. I I am sad that we don't get oxygen here in Canada. So I found it through nefarious means on the internet. But uh, it's a great channel. I mean, I, I really wish we could get it here. But for some reason, our Canadian copyright laws or whatever, maybe interest, there's got to be, there's tons of interest in true crime here. But I don't know what it is that's preventing uh, that, that channel in particular from uh, being available here because we want to see it. Yeah. Well, hopefully soon. Eventually, I think it'll happen, you know, like anything. Yeah, but they'll have to put Canadian content in there due to our, our rules. And uh, I don't think a lot of Americans want to learn about people stealing maple syrup. <laughs> well, it, it, maybe once. 
<laughs> Maybe once, but not multiple shows on that. But uh, now, now, so you, now, what you do, diff- you do this differently. Like um, for us on the radio, mm-hmm. we um, what what I do is I um, uh, I see cases and, and I I know lawyers and detectives yeah. and I know a lot of yep. uh, people involved, all the way prosecutors and some famous, some not, and. Um, yep. You see a case and you kind of get interested and you just kind of go with it and uh, now and what what ends up happening is I'll follow the case and then when the case is done I'll get the court documents I'll get the uh, police records I'll mm-hmm. speak speak to the people that were involved families and victims that survived and then the killer or killers and their families and I usually try to put together a book myself and put it up. Yeah. And so in that case, when I interview people on, on my day of the House of Mystery, it's five days a week, but I, I try to do the same thing. So I try to get people on that were out in the case working it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so I can get some um, real information in the book, not just what you hear on the news. Right. Um, so now, but what you guys do is you guys actually retell the story mm-hmm. of the murder, or yeah, the, or the or the crime or whatever it is. Yeah. Essentially, what we'll do is we'll retell the story around the crime, hopefully with a focus on the the victims and their families. Uh, so we try to learn as much as we possibly can about them. Um, I'm a big fat nobody. Uh, well, I have been uh, up until. Recently, it's been difficult for us to to reach out, and we don't know, you know, how to contact people uh, around this. So, learning from people like yourself and and uh, and other journalists, we are starting to sort of incorporate more of that into our world as well. And I think that's gonna. It's just a uh, a natural progression of our show. We started out just wanting to tell true crime stories. Um, just from our perspective, but we want to have more people uh, on our show to talk about the facts and those kind of things. So uh, that's why I'm I'm reaching out to people like yourself and and other authors and journalists about these kind of things because you guys can teach me a, a thing or two, and <laughs> then uh, then perhaps I don't have to be the guy who just looks at court documents and uh, tries to sort out the the truth uh, from the fiction in books and things like that. Um, I can also have people who were there on our show and have conversations with them. So that's what I'm leading to. But right now I think our show is pretty fun. Like, I mean, we do tell a story and it's from a uniquely Canadian perspective too. We'll, there's always that spin on it that uh, only Canadians can bring, I think. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There is a Canadian sense of humor that, Believe me, when you're in certain states, they do not get it. Yep. <laughs> I'm well aware of that. <laughs> and sometimes they even get angry. <laughs> yes. Oh, we've, we've had that too. Yeah. Uh, our our one-star reviews when we're – I mean, we're just making fun. We, we just are having fun. Sometimes we have said things about uh, um, the current American president that uh, we, ju- we're, we, don't, we don't mean any harm. But uh, we have had very uh, vitriolic reactions about. So uh, we tend to steer away from that now. It's probably better for our health. Well, you can look at it that way. I think. I think for the most part, uh, in history, this is the first time it's so um, so serious. Yeah. Um, like you know, I, I make jokes about Trump all the time. I make yeah. jokes about uh, Hillary and. Everybody, I just make, you know, if someone does something funny, it's funny. It is. <laughs> I, just, I, you know, and that's my Canadian right sides going. You know, yep. this is silly. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean you hate the person. No, it just no. it's just funny. Um, Donald People, Trump's hair is funny. It is funny and ridiculous, and yeah. I would lo- I would like to learn about the complexities of what what on earth. Does his morning look like? How do, how does how does he get it to a point where you know it's acceptable for him to walk out the door? That's it's got to be a quite a trial. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, 
and, and you know, he's probably got someone blowing orange tan <laughs> on his face, and he's twittering, and he's got his hair up, and <laughs> you paint up quite and, a you paint quite a picture. <laughs> and then at the same on the fox going on the side, and yeah, uh, and you know, but this is funny. Uh, if if that was if that was Hillary in that boat, I'd be laughing too. Hair and curls. Oh, for sure. You know, I just, I think they're way too uptight. But that's because we are Canadian and get more of a, yeah. you know, we don't get upset at like that. There's a it's, few, but. I love the U.S. I, it's tough for me to watch uh, how um, divided the, the country is right now. I mean, we've had great experiences in the United States every time we've been there, and we, we know lovely people from the United States on both sides politically. And, uh, but now, you know, those people who we care about are at odds. It's very tough to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, we, you go, I go through the same thing. I have people, uh, um, and I try to stay neutral, but you know, most people know I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm kind of to myself and uh, I have a close core of people that work with me, and uh, mm-hmm. and they know I'm, I'm kind of a cynic, and I kind of make fun, and it's all sarcastic, and it's you got to have a little dark humor because if you don't laugh, yeah. it, it, it yeah. just it's just what's the point of living? I worked in uh, I worked in a cemetery. I was a grave digger at one point in a cemetery, and I learned a lot about uh, if if you will grave humor. <laughs> working there, um, you know, you have to de- You're dealing with such a tough subject all the time. Police, paramedics, doctors. Uh, some of those people that I've met, because I also worked in uh, in security and would have to be in those areas. Uh, some of them have the darkest senses of humor that a, of anybody that I've ever known, and it's just the way they deal with their day to day. Otherwise, they'd all be suffering horrible PTSD. Yeah. Do you know I did an interview ways back with uh, that um, Dr. Catherine Ramsland. And mm-hmm. She spent five years with the BTK killer. Yes. And uh, mm-hmm. did a big book on it and did a whole an analysis of, of, of him. And, and, you know, really interesting. So we did a show. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and she was talking, and we were talking, you know, just about things. And then she goes, um, you know, quite often, different days, um, this this killer would see himself as different people. Yeah. And and so I said, well, how do you know who he who he was seeing himself with? And she said, well, you sort of, so you'd have sort of have to ask or kind of work your way into it. But one one of the things that was funny was. Uh, uh, he saw himself as Britney Spears. Weird. And he so he's in prison, and uh, they'd be in their in their uh, discussion in t- interview room, and uh, so how do you feel like today? And he, I feel like Britney Spears, and have his wig on and have his um, and act very feminine, and he felt very happy, uh, feeling like Britney Spears. That's very, very strange. Well, uh, yeah, you know, like, wow. Well, you know, th- these are the things you don't really hear about, you know. No. Uh, and so I thought that, that was crazy. Um, incredible good good uh, information. And uh, so, so we were talking a little later on the show, and then I said, uh, and she said, well, you know, if we could go a little bit longer. And I said, well, I'll, I, I'll have to check to see how I feel. I'm yeah. feeling a little bit like Britney Spears right now. <laughs> And of course, she laughed, and I laughed, and it was just—it was hilarious. Yeah, I mean, four thousand complaints to the station. Are you serious? Four thousand. Because you said you feel like Britney Spears uh, in relation to BTK feeling like Britney Spears. Well, yeah. Well, no, they were primarily upset because we were making fun of a murderer and making fun of all the people that he made suffer and 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 killed and good uh, lord we were making light of it and this was um not something to be made light of and that's the roundabout of every single one of those how can you laugh 
like like things like that. We have had we have had experiences like that with our show too, uh, where people are offended by our humor, but we we try not to la- ever 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 uh, be disrespectful to the crime to the victim, and we even try to understand uh, the criminal himself. Although my co-host likes to call them uh, various color- colorful words, um, we we try not to be. Uh, disrespectful to that process at all because it's a really fine line to walk. Is it? Is it? Uh, are you doing it tastefully or is it like just like uh, I don't know? And if I get that twinge in my gut like that, uh, I don't know. I don't know if this is somewhere we, we sh- where we should go. It probably doesn't make <laughs> make the main show. But that said, we are we are. Two two guys who have a great sense of humor, and so sometimes there are going to be things that you know that just make us laugh, because otherwise we'd be crying. I don't want to cry through my entire show. <laughs> well, and I think it's just a way of dealing with what it is we're dealing with. Exactly, it's a it's a natural human reaction. Actually, humor to a very dark situation is a very healthy way to deal with. Uh, as Carl Jung called it, the shadow. We never quite are able to contact that directly, uh, but humor is a way for us to contact that darkness without it affecting us too negatively. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, and and we all find our ways. But I, uh, that's that's what works for me. And so we even call it a dark, uh, you know, cynical, comedic look. At yeah. Unsolved mysteries in in crime, yeah. history, paranormal, and different. So so uh, because I want it to be entertaining, I want it to be factual, but mm-hmm. I also want it to be um, relaxed. I, I you know I I don't want I didn't want a heavy show. No, and some people will tell me um, they would rather me just share the dry story, and they don't want my co-host there making comments or anything because he doesn't do any show prep or anything like that he's kind of like uh uh ed mcmahon or andy richter he'll he comes in and he he does he does his role very very well he's an excellent guy scott hemingway uh great photographer loves black and white photos but uh people poo poo what we do sometimes because they don't get it. Like, I actually need this guy there so I don't go completely insane telling this really, really dark story. He's there to help me. He's right. there, he's, he's yeah. there to help me get through, uh, this really dark thing. When I'm talking about Clifford Olson, for example, that man murdered 11 children. Children. And horrifically murdered, coldly murdered 11 children in our neighborhood. We live in Surrey and he, he did his things uh, here and in Coquitlam and Richmond. Um, so us talking about that, it's a very personal thing. I was, uh, uh, there was, a, I went through an attempted abduction when all the Clifford Olson stuff was going on uh, as an 11 year old boy. And uh, I remember connecting to that case very, very personally. Uh, so Scott bringing his humor to help me out, to get me through that, is is a godsend. <laughs> you know, I really, really, uh, I need that in my life. I need a little bit of humor with my darkness. Otherwise, it's all darkness. I've been a depressive. I've been a depressive and major depression for for a lot of my life. And, um, you know, I found my way out through humor. You know, if I, I if I can't laugh at myself and the situation I'm in, I'm screwed. <laughs> I really am. Oh, totally. Uh, I'm in the exact same boat. I go through the same feelings up and down like a toilet seat. Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. A clean toilet seat. A clean one. There you go. There you go. Yeah. No, it's. Um, I really like having a co-host that does the buffer. Yeah, uh, and yeah, uh, that kind of it's it just gives you that rail. Yeah, I I it, I think it makes the show better. Um, I I'm think actually, so. Sorry, we just we actually just lost our main co-host. So, oh oh dear, yeah, oh, that sucks. So yeah. I mean, was it? Did he move or? No, he's going to. Um, 
um, he's going to go into a political show. Oh, for, there you for go. The, for a conservative um, yep. group. So he's just doing his thing. Uh, yeah, it hasn't started, and that's kind of, I guess that was the direction he wanted to take in. Mm. Um, and that's fine. Um, like I said, people come and go, so we'll see, yeah. what, see what happens next. Yeah, so what was his role for you? He was my buffer. He was the there you go the, the fill in, and because um, I what we do is we're five days a week, so we're running mm-hmm. running a, a usually a true crime day, and then uh, we run a conspiracy day. Cool. Uh, well, the conspiracy day we do with Dr. Joe Usinski. Okay. And he's out of University of Miami, and he's written some books, and uh, he does things from uh, critical thinking, skeptical. He's uh, logic. So it's not easy to uh, – I think he does a great show. Great show. There you go. And That's then, awesome. And th- and then we've got Julie Saab. She's a medium from Most Wanted out of the U.K. Mm-hmm. And she does our Friday paranormal show. And uh, then we have Stephen David Lampley. Hmm, I know that name. Uh, he's uh, Crimes and Forensics. Uh. He um, – He's written a lot of books, and he's been on Nancy Grace a lot. He does our Tuesday show, um, Crime and Forensics with Steve. There you go. And that's, so there, there you have it. We have a little bit of everything. That sounds like fun. That sounds like a fun week. Yeah, actually, we, we it, well, it is usually. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, it, it is because uh, we get to cover a lot of mysteries, mm-hmm. from a lot of different angles, and we would uh, kind of – float off of each other as well so um you know if 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 one person can't make it another host can make it you know so we like to run with two throughout each show if we can yeah sure that makes sense you know. so um as far as uh show prep and those kind of things what what does that look like for you are you like completely prepping shows all week long or are you uh, relying a lot on what your guests bring I don't, I, I don't know. Well, how um, that, what what that looks like, you know, uh, I, you, that took a lot of years to. You, you find your way, uh, mm-hmm. and for me, when I watch a lot of interviews or see a lot of um, radio or TV, the, the the things I don't like are the common things. I got gotcha. you. The basic, the standards, the, the, yeah. the you know, you know this. A woman getting run over by a car, and how does that make you feel? Well, it's pretty you, bad. Yeah, you know, you lost two kids, and how how are you feeling now? Well, yeah, you know, I, I'm sort of not really into any of that stuff. I prefer to get as much information about the person as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, I contact all of them. I, I ever since the beginning, like ten years now, I've I've always. Um, Coming from production, I always got the uh, uh, contact information and uh, did all the communications, set everything up. Uh, and then um, what I usually do with guests is try to find out what it is that they would like to talk about, what's most important to them, yeah, and what's not. And, yeah. of course, their book or, or movie will be promoted by the website mm-hmm. and, and a mention. But I don't want to just sit there and focus on that. And and right now I've got a team that's all on the same wavelength. I think that uh, we will ask them questions that they don't expect. Yeah, that's great. That's really cool, actually. You know, we had we had the Witch of Salem on. You know. Mm, okay. And, and Julie and I it was like the first thing was like, um, so what's it like having sex with the Witch of Salem? Oh wow. And, and, you know, they're not going to get something very standard. There'll and some so do you, do you prepare them for that? <laughs> I think most of them get to know it now. Most of okay. them know us. The first year it was a little bit bumpy. Yeah. But, um, but most of them like it and most of them, uh, because it's not mean-spirited. I mean, we even, sure. it was kind of even a joke where this, this, this witch had uh, a daughter that started dating men and it's like, uh, and then it was just—it just came to me. Okay, I'm dating this girl, and I'm coming home to mother, and she's a witch. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How do you yeah. reconcile that? 
<laughs> you know, and you know, I, but I think f- for me, the success of an interview is making a connection and mm-hmm. having a good, good conversation, and and you both learn something from each other, and the audience does as well. And at the end of the hour, if they're driving, like a lot of our people are driving when they hear us. Hopefully you haven't driven into a river or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, or they're driving to the studio <laughs> to pick at us. But if if they're in you know, or wherever they are, online driving, hopefully it interests them enough. They go, well, that person was pretty cool. I liked what he or she said. I liked that. That was yeah. cool. And, and they, they'll at least go to the website, the book site, and maybe buy something of theirs. Yeah, like yesterday, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Morgan Knudsen, who is a paranormal investigator out of Edmonton. And uh, we were talking to her specifically about um, the Great Amherst Mystery. So in Amherst, Nova Scotia, in 1878 to 1879, a young girl named Esther Cox was uh, haunted. She went through this very well-documented uh, poltergeist experience. You can Google it. It's pretty pretty easy to to learn about. But uh, Morgan and I had never met, and I interviewed her probably for about 45 minutes, but I left feeling like, wow, I really enjoyed that. I felt like she learned a little bit from me about sort of what we do, but I learned so much from her, and I just want to talk to her every time I do a paranormal show, you know? <laughs> like Now it's like I've got my go-to person if, if I want to – want to have a conversation about ghosts or poltergeists or hauntings or anything like that. Yeah. And you know, and over years you do develop quite a rapport with people, quite a quite a group of people. Yeah, it's 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 like I say, this is all new to me. I'm just I'm I'm learning as I go and I think this is the way to go. I'm kind of glad I didn't go to like the the go to be like a DJ in radio and, you know, this was and that is or, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. I have gotten to do what I really want to do right out of the gate. So I'm I'm a very, very lucky guy in that way. Yeah. Well, I did. I, I was in uh, on C89 in Seattle mm-hmm. and I was playing uh, dance music, disco, and uh, it was sure. a good lesson uh, for me. I didn't mind that. Um, I um I could I was, have done it, but I, well, I'm I'm and I've always been a radio guy since I was five. Mm-hmm. Young, I always had crystal radios, radio, radio, radio. Listen to old shows, talk shows. That was who I was. So that's yep. where it came from for me. No, and I think that's why I went into it sort of how, like you say, because now I've got a Rolodex here or a phone, a phonodex. <laughs> Yeah, of some incredible guests I've met now that I have their personal numbers, we're friends, and I actually get to meet when I, they're in town or if I'm out of town, and some people that I would have never thought I'd even ha- would have met in my life. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. I'm getting to meet the coolest people. I have I have family members of, of murder victims emailing me, telling me I did a fantastic job of of telling their story and and how. Um, we were so kind to um, their relative, and their they want to be want their relatives' last moments to be remembered in that way, uh, which is like wow, that's that's really flattering. I would have never gotten to know that person had I not sort of put it out there. And also, like you say, now prior to uh, when I'm doing this research, I'm actually grown a a little bit of a. Uh, a backbone and I'm reaching out to people prior and and more than off more than not people are more than willing to have a conversation about what went on as long as they know that you're not somebody who is going who is there to sensationalize or insult them yeah yeah it's more about that yeah there's uh yeah there's so many angles to it that they want to protect themselves but uh yeah, I've, like I said, I've been producing for so many years. I uh, um, I can call Roger Stone before he goes to jail. <laughs> he probably should. He's uh, gonna probably we, be away for a while. Yeah, we've had I had him on before. Just Unless before. he gets pardoned by that certain somebody. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Orange. 
Yeah. I'm wondering what's going to happen with all that. I mean, you know, I don't quite understand the whole thing or what the crime was or that kind of stuff. Like the, the rush was, was he colluding with Russians is, is well, how much? I, I think the big thing is that, um, it was set up to, um, see if Russia was interfering in the election process. Which and, they were. And having any collusion of any of, uh, of the president's aides or uh, support team or employees type thing. Yeah. And so that happened. And um, what's gone down is over the last couple of years, now you've got, what, at least six that have already been indicted and, and charged and booked in, in, in the collusion, in, in the... Um, you know, it, 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 when it comes to a level of an aide doing something, yeah, you're interrupting in, in crime. Mm -hmm. It's not direct collusion, but you're doing it for someone. And, and you know, the thing is, um, there was a lot of illegal activities. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to jail for it. And um, my opinion is that uh, most of it's about money. Oh, yeah. I don't think Isn't, any, any of it's about Russia, U.S. or anything. I don't think Trump could care less about U.S. any more than he could about anything. He's a money guy. He's a he's a capitalist, and yeah. that's all he is concerned about. He doesn't care about uh, uh, gays, blacks, Mexicans, um, anything. Uh, you know, he can put on a little bit of a show, but he really doesn't care about anything but getting business done. Yeah, you know, getting deals for himself. It's all about getting paid. Yeah, and, yeah, and and I think that they'll 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 pay for it down the road because they now have a huge um, deficit that will take forever to get rid of. Yeah, and they're not really in a uh, company a equi country equipped to work their way out of it like they used used to be before years ago. Right. So it's kind of a mess. It is. It looks like a mess <laughs> from from where I sit. It looks That's like why it. I laugh when when we hear about things about Trudeau or about the Landvin deal and all this. Or I just sort of think, God, wow, this is pretty it, pretty pretty funny. <laughs> well, it's so Trudeau was uh, censured by uh, the uh, Conservative Party for eating a chocolate bar on the uh, on the floor yesterday. So in the House of Commons, our Prime Minister snuck a chocolate bar into the House of Commons and, and ate it on the House of Commons floor and was called out by the Conservatives later on. So uh, we're very happy that the Conservatives have the most uh, important uh, <laughs> things on their mind to call our Prime Minister out on. Like, oh my God. And he said, I'm sorry, it was a chocolate bar. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because when, the, uh, uh, when they talk about that, I just think, oh, God, can you be any more embarrassing? <laughs> We're very quaint up here, I guess. You know? well, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. At least it's, uh, things are pretty good overall, and we should be happy. There you go. How long do you take to put together one of your episodes? On average, uh, on average, uh, it de it depends on the episode, really. Uh, some of them I know very well. Like for example, when we did our Ed Gein episode, I pretty much wrote that in an afternoon because uh, I had read and knew so much about the facts. I just had to go do just a little bit of fact che fact checking on it. Um, but other ones uh, will take me. The average is about three three days of writing uh, just to make sure that it's presentable and, and, and ready to go. So, yeah, about three days. Now, which, are, you, are you scripting a show and just kind of going over the crime or are you actually um, pretend to have an episode with people that are acting different roles? Uh, it's just me telling the story, but sometimes I will put on an accent myself, <laughs> just for just for fun. Um, and some people really really like that. Like we did uh, Harry Houdini 
and so I did a bit of an accent for that one. I, I obviously wouldn't do uh, too much of an accent for, you know, say I'm going to be a serial killer or something, and, and I don't want people giggling at my accent as I'm a serial killer. But, um, yeah, mostly it's just tell the, tell the story of the crime from beginning to end and uh, bed in some music and those kind of things. But we try, try, try very hard to be to be factual. And like I say, there's a lot of different true crime books. I think people just make stuff up. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of kind of crappy because okay, this made up thing that you say is that true? Like I I don't know. Like if I can't find corroborating information in at least three other places, then I don't I don't bother with it. So yeah, it's really it's really tough. I, I've noticed that because uh, a lot of the podcasts lost my interest because they they would just sort of say things that I were kind of thinking well that's not even close or yeah that's and not I, true. and I don't want to be that guy either so it's very hard for us like these little true crime podcasters who are just learning and we want to tell the story we want to you know Canadian crime a lot of it has been forgotten uh over the years and we're a very regional country uh you'll hear about a crime in BC, uh, if you live in BC, but you won't hear about it in uh, Ontario or the Atlantic provinces at all, which is interesting, unless it's been a big thing, like a serial killer, like Cody Legibokov or, or someone like that. People in Eastern Canada will know who that is, but we don't hear about those things here. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do is tell stories from every different province because there will be people in other provinces who haven't heard the BC stories. There will be people in other provinces who haven't heard the Manitoba stories, you know. So um, that's why I, I feel like I'm able to provide something that Canadians, quite frankly, don't get from the uh, regular media, which is real Canadian stories. Well, we, the uh, media is tied down by law as well. Yeah, um, that's why we can't have shows like Nancy Grace and yeah, well, you know all that stuff. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't talk a lot about unsolved because I'm tied down by laws as well. So unsolved murders specifically, I can't come out and say this guy's got to be the one who did it because uh, I would find myself in court very quickly here in Canada. So, uh, but yeah. Nancy Grace does what she does, and she does it uh, very loudly, so it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, I think that, um, but that's just it. You know, in Canada, there's a lot of privacy laws, and there's also, mm -hmm. uh, like when I was doing the Russell Williams things, and, and even the girl that was attacked mm -hmm. was, was still 19 during the 2017 uh, uh trial where she won money uh, yeah we still couldn't use her name yeah and and there's a, there's a lot of that here i run into that a lot when i'm trying to cover canadian cases there's one uh, for example in in uh uh red deer and it's a fascinating case about a 12 year old girl who along with her boyfriend killed her parents and her younger brother but because of privacy laws and the fact that um naming her parents would identify her. I can't talk about that case, which is, is, it drives me insane because it's a really, really compelling case. Very interesting. I can, I could talk about it in a way where, uh, everybody has an alias, but I don't know. That just doesn't kind of, uh, have the same uh, weight to it in a way. Yeah. 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 It's pretty strange. Now, how, where do you see your taking your, podcast like where where is it going to end up if if i hate to say that stupid question but in five years where do you see yourself <laughs> um well I, I mean honestly i have always had an interest in documentary film so i would like to be uh doing something a little more uh video wise with uh our show and i'm starting to learn a little bit more about how to how to get that done i spent uh, a lot of time working in film uh, film production and, and that kind of thing. So I really have a good understanding of it, but I want, I want to be the guy 
in front of the camera or doing the creative and not be the plebe who's, you know, moving the garbage cans. So, uh, so that there's a little bit of work that needs to happen before that can go on. So I'm just learning about producing and things like that. Eventually we're going to have some video. Uh, I can see, uh, what we would really like to do is take our show and do, you know, a certain number of episodes every uh, series, every season, where we cover a single case in a different province in Canada, and we actually go there and tell the story in the town where it's happening, where it had happened. So we would have the people on who were related to it and all that kind of stuff, it's sort of like a campfire talk, uh, but it would be a true crime campfire talk. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent idea. I think it is. Um, you can turn it into a reality show. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, well, I don't want to be murdered. Uh, it, it's I I don't mind covering my co-host being murdered. I mean, he's he's yeah. No, that's not true. <laughs> I love Scott. He's a great guy. But uh, but yeah, I I do definitely want to do something like that where I can bring. Canadian stories to other Canadians that they may not have heard otherwise. That's always kind of been my thing is just because I, I'm a Canadian through and through. Scott and I are like Bob and Doug McKenzie. Uh, our presentation is a little bit like that. Or if you're Canadian, you know of the, the Red Green Show. Do you know the Red Green Show? Yeah. And, and his, so it's Red Green, the grumpy old fart with the beard and, <laughs> and Harold. His nerdy nephew, who's with him, that so I sort of see I'm the grumpy old man with the beard, and Scott is the nerdy nephew. <laughs> but, well, yeah. there you go, a whole new outlook on <laughs> dark Putin. The name. Yeah. Why the name. did you choose the name? Well, there was already a podcast called Canadian True Crime, so we couldn't do that. I mean, I could have. I could have been a jerk about it and, and gone ahead and did that. But but uh, I like Christy's show, and she does a fantastic job. Uh, so I thought, I need to come up with something that helps me to stand out. And one thing is, like, what's the most Canadian thing I can think of? And it's poutine. And for Americans who don't know, poutine is, a, is French fries with beef gravy and cheese, melted cheese curds. It's fantastic, and it will probably give you a heart attack at some point if you eat too much of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a heavy thing. It's super heavy. You can't get enough of it, and it's a little bit cheesy. So, poutine actually really does <laughs> cover what the show is. And dark poutine. And you know, we talk about pretty dark things. Uh, talking about serial killers, crimes, uh, UFOs. Uh, ghosts and all that kind of stuff. I think darkness is uh, is a good uh, a good adjective. What, what what you know? So you had an interest for all the crime and stuff. What brought you um, in with the UFOs and and paranormal side? Ah, I've always just been interested in that as well. Um, I don't know how much uh, I really believe. I think I'm a healthy skeptic, but. Uh, I, I would like to believe that these things exist. And there's so many of those kind of stories people are telling uh, across Canada. Canada, you know, every year has almost 2,000 UFO reports, which is, is fairly interesting. And so why not cover some of those? Uh, Bigfoot, uh, the, the Sasquatch, uh, Ogopogo, all those kind of things. Uh, are they real? I don't know, but I'd like to investigate and have a conversation about them, and maybe maybe I'll learn something, or maybe I won't. I don't know. Maybe it really is just a guy in a gorilla suit. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or down in Surrey, I see a few. <laughs> there, there's definitely that here, <laughs> and we don't talk about uh, a lot of crime here in Surrey, uh, specifically the organized crime, because we want to be alive. At the end of our shows, uh, yeah. <laughs> we we would rather not talk about, uh, uh, like for example, the Surrey Six. I am never going to approach that with a ten foot pole because the the guys who perpetrated that are still out walking around. So I am not interested in having any conversation about my opinions about that particular case. Yeah, it's probably better to stay away from stuff like that. 
Mm-hmm. And and motorcycle enthusiasts as well. Like we we'll steer clear of those people too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Much safer. Yeah. Wow. So <clears throat> something in my throat here. Very interesting. Very interesting. What what is uh, your biggest influence? Uh my biggest influence. I loved Art Bell. I loved Art Bell when I was a kid. Uh, well, not necessarily a kid, but you know, I was. I used to drive security at night, uh, and so I would just listen to Art Bell, the Art Bell show. Right. Um, I also was really into Unsolved Mysteries when I was a, a little kid, and Robert Stack. Yep. Uh, I thought that guy was fantastic. Um, you know, like he told all those stories, uh, and some of them were Canadian stories too. And so it's like I kind of want to be the Canadian Robert Stack, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have I don't have that great voice that he had, or, you know, that gravelly kind of. But uh, yeah, so um, and another thing, I think the other thing that got me into tr- true crime was what I mentioned uh, to you earlier. Um, I was actually the victim of a uh, a crime when I was 11 years old, on the day that uh, Charles and Diana were married. Uh, July 29th, 1981, I was walking home from playing some floor hockey with my buddies, and uh, a man grabbed me and uh, tried to drag me into the woods and told me that he was going to do various and sundry dirty things to me. And that was my first quote-unquote sexual experience in my life was uh, this man being violent with me. Um, I did end up getting away, um, screaming and yelling and running to a neighbor's place. It was only... Uh, about 200 meters away from my parents' home, but uh, but that really affected me for a long time. My reactions, uh, my reactions to seeing him around town later on, uh, those kind of things, and I became really interested in the 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 human condition and crime as a result of of that. And I was later uh, in another situation where uh, a gentleman uh, tried to make hamburger out of my head on a on a brick wall over a, a, a mutual girlfriend that we had so <laughs> I have been uh, let's say involved in a in a couple of crimes in the victim aspect <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wasn't uh, it wasn't it wasn't pleasant but uh, I had to go to court for that particular one, the later one, uh, where I had to testify against that gentleman, and he was actually convicted. Uh, but um, so I guess it's those couple of events really, really got my interest in true crime. And then somebody gave me a copy of Helter Skelter, and and I guess the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> that it all began. Yeah. All began. Well, that's pretty interesting. And any other? Um, what, what kind of shows do you like to watch? Music. Uh oh well, music. I mean, uh, I'm a grunge fan. Um, I like Nirvana. We went to uh, when Kurt Cobain died. Uh, my wife and I, both of us, really loved Nirvana. And she wasn't my wife at the time; she was my girlfriend. Then we drove down to. Uh, to Seattle, and we hung out in the park right next door to Kurt and Courtney's house, and uh, just hung out with a bunch of kids. Like there was probably six or seven. It was a, about a week and a half, a week week after he had he had killed himself, and it was after the big um, uh, sort of funeral they had for him in Seattle. Um, but kids were still hanging around there, and, and I can remember just like. Going there and being there, and there was a note on the tree from Courtney Love, who you know uh, had left a little bit of a thank you um, for our love of Kurt, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, and I took some folks out to to get them some beer. So I'm driving. I drove out to get some beer, and in the meantime, after we came back, we found that Courtney had given a couple of Kurt's sweaters away, and so <laughs> I, I missed out. On having a, like an an authentic Kurt Cobain sweater by probably about five minutes. Oh, <laughs> I know. But <clears throat> well, listen, I know Courtney. Oh wow, yeah. yeah. And I appreciate like you taking time to to talk to some somebody like me because I don't know, like I'm just I'm just new. I'm just getting things going, and uh, and it means a lot that 
that uh, people who have been around the business and, and uh, actual journalism and those kind of things are are paying attention to us a little bit. It you know it really really means a lot to to get people's time. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.